Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am Cheryl Kippen, Cultural History Program Coordinator with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. And we are going to extend our learning a little bit here and um, do a little more learning about Doc Susie and about old fashioned medicine. And this is just a drop in the bucket. We could talk about this for a long, long time and study about this for a long time. Um, so we're just gonna get, take another glimpse into this um, to kind of add to um, what Linda Batlin as Doc Susie already said. So I'm gonna start um, my PowerPoint here and share my screen and, um, and we'll do a little more learning. There we go. All right, now I'm gonna move this screen around a little bit to someplace I hope won't interfere with, with the pictures that we're gonna take a look at. So hopefully this will work. All right, so as I said, we're going to take a further glimpse into medicine of yesteryear with um, Doc Susie as well, and just kind of do a little more learning. So here we go. Well, as we can probably guess during the um, late 19th century time period and before that, and as well as after that, um, medicine crossed cultures in um, North America. And um, you know there were a lot of differences going on, a lot of changes, a lot of new things coming in, and a lot of old traditions as well. And each culture had different ways. We can't know all about them, and you know neither was none were right or wrong. And um, you know it's just really fascinating to learn about these and to explore them. Um, we can see for some the indigenous cultures, the American Indian, Native American cultures, that medicine at times was more spiritual. Um, with their sweat lodges, medicine bundles, and rattles, and things like that. And of course, as these cultures um, you know, came into, into being, and as these cultures interacted with one another, some cultures would adapt to what other cultures brought, and share, and learn from others. And then again, for others, unfortunately, it would be a difference. It would be a way for them to be apart, and to be set apart from one another. And medical facilities, as you might be able to guess, during Doc Susie's time and before and after definitely varied. And here we can see some different kinds of medical facilities um, in the American West. Um, you know, sometimes people had to go with what was there and accept it. Maybe again, sometimes this would bring differences and, and you know, less survival if people weren't able to accept what was there. You just can't tell. And so here we have a tent drug store and, you know, Looks like, you know, if you went in, we hope that there would be shelves and tables with what was offered, but we don't know, but they made do with what they had. Here we see um, Dr. Pock's office and surgery, um, a medical doctor, and of course he's of Asian, Asian heritage. We see here that some doctors practice medicine with just whatever was available and wherever they were. These are two Civil War doctors, so perhaps this is during wartime. But again, they just you know, had a table and put it out on the side of the road, out, out of their wagon, and did surgery where they were able to do it. And they also, of course, had operating theaters. Now, we usually call these operating rooms now, but in Doc Susie's time, especially for those that were learning medicine and studying medicine, they called them operating theaters. Um, still today, I believe in, the, in Britain, they also call an operating room an operating theater. And you can see that they were set up kind of like a theater, kind of like an auditorium. The seats have numbers, people are you know, seated together. And that was a place where you would of course go if you were studying medicine to see someone being operated on. And that was a way that you could learn to do surgery. And we can see in, several, in all of these pictures actually that there are several women. So women were studying medicine like Doc Susie did and like others did. And this is a really great example of that. And we can see several ladies in each one of these photos um, you know, observing um, a medical procedure, a surgery in the operating theater. And as we can guess in the American West, treatments and remedies definitely varied. I mean, they do still today really with, with medicine. Now we see here with these plants that, you know, some of the um, Western medicine treatments and American frontier treatments might be more comparable to American Indian, indigenous and Native American treatments in using plants and using herbs and using things from nature. And of course, we also have another item from nature, um, leeches being used um, to bleed people and also just people being bled and cut open um, to hopefully cure them. Now that's kind of questionable, it seems to me, because I don't know who would think that someone losing blood or someone having blood taken from them um, was gonna make them feel better. But 
Probably it did for someone at one time. So then doctors at certain time periods just kept using that um, forward as a you know, part of their med medical procedure. We see here down at the bottom, a doctor who is putting a patient's shoulder back into socket um, after it's been dislocated, just using the force of that doctor's body. And um, you know that's something that seems, oh, wow, would that work? But they actually still do that if a shoulder gets dislocated. They actually still do manipulate the body similar to that. And um, you know, I guess it does work. So, um, And then we also see here down in the bottom corner, snake oil liniment, the kinds of medicines that were available during this time period that were kind of medicines, because we find out now that, you know, this one's supposed to cure everything. And so many of those were supposed to be a cure-all, but really a lot of times we found that they had very high percentages of alcohol. They had very high percentages of what are now illegal drugs, opium and other things. And so I'm sure they made the patient feel different. Sometimes they probably made them feel better. Sometimes they probably made them feel worse, but certainly again, kind of a questionable um, idea of whether it was a cure and certainly not a cure for all of the things that so many of those um, medicines claim to be cure-alls for everything. And medical instruments of the past. Now we see that you know, a lot of them seem to look a little bit familiar with familiar uses. They don't always look exactly the same as the medical instruments that we see nowadays if we go and visit our doctor. Um, so here we have in the bottom corner here, a bunch of stethoscopes of the past. And we can see that we can probably imagine how those were used. And they look a little bit similar to the stethoscopes that our doctors use nowadays. Um, if you watch um, Call the Midwife on PBS or on Netflix, they do use some instruments kind of like these to listen to the baby's heartbeats. And so, you know, they are things that were used, you know, well into the, the um, mid 20th century and even a bit later um, for some, some doctors. We see here in this upper right corner, um, a mobile doctor's kit from the Civil War. And so you can see now, we don't know exactly how big this was, maybe a little bit bigger than would fit in a pocket, but maybe almost a pocket kit that the doctors could fold up and have on hand and take with them and, and, and have in a very small space to be able to use with their patients. And we can also see down here in the bottom right-hand corner, um, an invention by Lister, which was very important, very, very important, disinfecting. For a long time, it wasn't seen that there was a connection between germs and between disease and between you know, death and people getting better or worse. And you know, sometimes it, it was all the difference with a doctor washing their hands, keeping the instruments clean and washing the place where the incision was going to be or the procedure was going to take place on the person to make sure that things were clean. And Lister came up with this and, um, you know, and I'm sure others did too, but he's the one that we have Listerine still as a disinfectant. And you know, so that was very, very important towards you know, people, keeping people healthy, towards um, lower mortality, um, towards higher survival rates and higher healing rates. And here we have Doc Susie. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about her. And this is from the Doc Susie exhibit in the Cousins Ranch Museum in Fraser, Colorado. Um, it may be in Winter Park, Colorado. They're just right next to each other right there. Um, so I think it's Frazier, but forgive me if it's in, if it's Winter Park instead, because you know it's just a matter of blocks where it switches there from from Winter Park to Frazier um, up there in the mountains. And so we see Doc Susie here on the left as a young lady, and you know we had heard from um, our our volunteer Linda Batlin in reenacting Doc Susie that Doc Susie was considered quite a beautiful young lady, and so we can see her picture and and decide for ourselves what we think about that. Then we have two other pictures of Doc Susie as an older lady, and you can still see that she seems to be very determined, kind of with a little bit of a stern look, standing very straight and proud. And um, so I think, you know, she does seem to kind of have a little smile on her face, too, um, in the lower picture. So, you know, perhaps, perhaps, and we would hope a friendly person and a friendly doctor that we would want to go to had we been living during these times. And we hear that Doc Susie, of course, had wanted to have children of her own, never did, but was very fond of children and very fond of her young patients. Doc Susie often collected pictures of her patients and we can see um, two of those patients pictured right here up at the top. And Doc Susie had many, many more pictures of her young patients that probably oftentimes she, she um, cared for from their birth, maybe all the way through their death throughout the span of their lifetime if they stayed in that um, Fraser area. So pretty fun, pretty interesting, and showing a very caring lady. 
Outside the, the um, cousin's ranch, there's also a mural that I have pictured here at the bottom. And that kind of shows a little bit about Doc Susie's life and her um, work in Colorado. We see her very first patient, the horse, and her treating that patient. We see the Moffat Tunnel and the importance of building that and how we know that Doc Susie wanted people to know that the hardworking people of the area built that tunnel and not those newspaper men and those publicists that were kind of trying to take claim for the tunnel. It was those workers, those everyday people who worked and built that tunnel for everyone to use. And then we also have Doc Susie treating patients in the 1918 flu epidemic as well, which was a very important and very serious um, occurrence in the area too. And at Cousins Ranch, we're fortunate to see some belongings of Doc Susie on exhibit. And now they have kind of a kind of a suitcase, a little suitcase that was a medical, medical bag of Doc Susie's, more like a medical case. It is wooden and it is pictured here and here, two different views of it. Now they don't describe what the instruments are in the case. Um, so we just kind of have to look at them and kind of have to guess. But um, you know, it's kind of neat to see that the actual you know, case that Doc Susie kept many of her instruments in. And we also see a quilt block that someone made showing Doc Susie going out at night in the snow with her lantern to treat patients as she did, especially during her younger years. And also definitely right there is her medical bag that she used too. So she probably wouldn't have taken that case on um, visits where she had to trek across the snow and go somewhere. I bet that case was just used if she you know, had office visits and to keep things in, in her office and in her home. But we can't really be sure. And then as we heard, Doc Susie used almost every method to get to her patients and she would go in all kinds of weather. And so we see here Doc Susie's snowshoes that she actually used very often um, to get to her patients because of course the climate where she lived it's a little different from here in Boulder County, but maybe similar to some of the higher elevation parts of Boulder County, and that there would be snow very often in the winter time, of course, and probably also often on those shoulder seasons, the spring mud season, and also the fall. And so we see a picture too of Doc Susie in the snow, in her snowshoes, with her medical bag in hand, going to treat patients, as we know that she did. And now we have, did Doc Susie go Hollywood? Now we have always heard that the television show in the 1990s, I believe, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman was based on Doc Susie's life. And actually that's not true. It seems to be that the only similarities between Dr. Quinn and Doc Susie are that they are based in Colorado. Um, Dr. Quinn um, actually took place um, earlier than when Doc Susie came to Colorado. And in fact, it took place in Colorado Springs, but during the time it started, Colorado Springs, I do not believe was even a town yet. So Hollywood took some liberties with that. And of course, Dr. Quinn, um, she adopted um, three children of a dying patient of hers, but we know from what we heard, Doc Susie never had any children, even though she would have loved to have had children. And we see that Dr. Quinn is with her love, Sully. And we know that Doc Susie never did get married, even though she you know, was engaged, but she never did get married. So again, Hollywood took some liberties and perhaps Dr. Quinn is also based on other female medical doctors of the time period, we're not sure. But I would think that if Doc Susie and Dr. Quinn would have been able to have a, a conversation, um, that probably they would have faced some similarities in um, being women in medicine, some similarities in living in Colorado and in the mountains, and um, you know some 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 of the same challenges, but probably also some differences as well. So it's kind of fun to think about. But you know we can like both stories, but they are not one and the same. And I'm just going to leave you with this slide um, about the 1980 Spanish flu um, versus what's going on now and has been going on for about the past year and a half now um, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Hmm, are there similarities? in a little bit over 100 years ago and nowadays in how they say the diseases are spread and what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do to protect ourselves and others? I don't know. Um, we see folks in this other picture getting onto a trolley, um, you know, the trolley operator wearing a mask, one person wearing a mask, the other one perhaps not. I don't know if the trolley operator is saying, oh, you've got to have a mask to get on to that other gentleman, perhaps. So we'll just kind of think about, you know, how time and, and history sometimes in a way repeats itself.
And we have our sources here, um, the Cousins Ranch Museum in Fraser, Colorado, of course, and a wonderful medical book that I'll show you here in a little bit um, about frontier medicine. And I think that that is it. So I thank you very much. I will stop sharing this. And then I wanna show you that medical book um, about the frontier West that I really enjoyed looking at to um, help with this. And it's been a few years since I've read it. So I will need to read it again. But this was a really great book that I looked to for this presentation. And that if you enjoyed this presentation, the story of Doc Susie, you will probably find to be really fascinating. Um, it goes from indigenous and Native American medicine and medicine from all those different cultures, all the way up to the kinds of things that um, Doc Susie would have practiced and other doctors as well. All right, well, I thank you so very much. Um, I hope that you enjoyed what we've had to say and um, continue learning about old fashioned medicine. I believe that Kathy Lucchetti also has a book probably from the 1980s or 1990s about frontier medicine that you might wanna take a look at. I haven't looked at it in quite some time, but um, those are usually pretty informative and pretty fun as well. And I'm sure there are many other resources out there and this is just a drop in the bucket. Thank you so very much and have a wonderful day.